Welcome back and happy Halloween everyone to another episode of Space This Week. Loads of stuff to talk about today from Starship Development, Falcon Heavy, Space Station updates from Tiangong and the ISS, Starlink, Soyuz, James Webb Space Telescope, the InSight mission and more. This video was sponsored by Amaze. More on them a little bit later on but first let's talk about Starship. Starbase Boca Chica remains an ever busy site as SpaceX really starts to ramp up things ahead of the first Starship orbital flight test. Starship Gazer captured some photographs of the ongoing works to reinforce Stage 0 in the form of the orbital launch mount's new leg shielding. SpaceX have been doing lots of work reinforcing Stage 0 to protect it from the heat and flames of a 33-engine Raptor ignition, in addition to protecting it from anomalies such as the one we saw with Booster 7 a few months ago. And speaking of Booster 7, there it is, just peeking in at the top of this photo here. The biggest testing we saw for Booster 7 last week was cryoproofing. Actually, we saw cryoproofing of Ship 24 as well, which remains stacked on top of the booster. The first round of testing happened on Monday. We saw partial filling of Ship 24 and Booster 7. You can see there the frost on both vehicles here and here. The next round of cryoproofing testing took place on Wednesday. We saw Booster 7's methane tank receive a small layer of frost, indicating the testing was taking place, which then disappeared upon detanking, but then reappeared appeared a couple of hours later, meaning that SpaceX did a repeat of this test. It's unclear why they felt the need to repeat the test again so soon, but I'm sure they had their good reasons. We also saw another mild filling of the methane tank for Ship 24 as well. While still on the subject of Ship 24 and Booster 7, will they still be the dynamic duo to perform the maiden flight of the Starship launch system? After all, for the better part of a year, we all thought that Booster 4 and Ship 20 would be the two vehicles to make the first ever orbital flight test, but after spending so long at the launch site without a flight, they were both retired in favour of Booster 7 and Ship 24. And now, well, Booster 7 and Ship 24 are starting to get on a bit. Will they go the way of 420 now that Booster 8 and Ship 25 are creeping onto their patch, hovering right next to the launch site there? Well, Marcus House wondered the same thing and asked Elon Musk on Twitter, who then confirmed that the plan is still very much to fly Booster 7 and Ship 24 for the first flight, unless of course they suffer damage during testing. And I would think that the damage required to retire these things would need to be fairly substantial at this point. After all, history has shown us that whether it's engine explosions or downcomer implosions, Booster 7 is a resilient beast. So I don't think there's a lot that could go wrong to stop this thing from flying, short of a catastrophic unplanned disassembly occurring. A sharp-eyed lab padre managed to catch a meteor shower close encounter at Starbase. Check that out in the background of this shot here and make a wish. I don't really have much more to say about this, but Lab Padre also captured this shot here of the stacking of Booster 9. We now appear to be at full height for this particular Super Heavy, bringing the total number of assembled Super Heavy boosters to 7. Booster 1, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8 and now 9. It's certainly starting to get a bit crowded down there at Boca Chica. Down at the launch site we already have Booster 7 and 8, and of course Booster 4 still stands proud in the Rocket Garden. Rest in pieces Boosters 1, 3 and 5, forever in our hearts. <laughs> anyway, yes, a brand new Super Heavy emerges. Later on we even saw SpaceX add on the chines that cover up those COPV tanks. All of this leaves me very excited. Almost as excited as I am to be working with Omaze this week. Omaze are offering you, dear viewer, a chance to win a brand new all-electric Hummer EV Edition 1 while simultaneously supporting a great cause, Rebuilding Together. Go to omaze.com slash to enter for your chance to win. Electric vehicles are a huge part of bettering the environment and reducing our reliance on fossil fuels, and it's great to see Hummer make the jump to electric. The EV Edition 1 is already sold out until who knows when, and it's built to go over almost anything while at the same time outperforming sports cars off the line thanks to its 1000 horsepower all-electric engine, providing an acceleration of 0 to 60 miles per hour in just 3 seconds. Now, what I love about Omaze is that they're a fundraising company that partners with charities for their sweepstakes, and for the Hummer EV Edition 1 experience, they're working with Rebuilding Together, a charity with the mission of preserving affordable home ownership and revitalizing communities with free home repairs for neighbors in need. They also help people in communities struck by natural disasters and help to rebuild safe and healthy housing in the months and years following a disaster. So, for your chance to win an all-electric Hummer EV Edition 1, go to omaze.com slash and enter today and donations will support the incredible work of rebuilding together.
Our eyes in the skies, Greg, Scott, and Fariel made another flyover at Starbase Florida last week. And man oh man do I have a lot to say about these photos. For one, look how substantial the Star Factory building is now. It's huge. We can see that doorways have been cut out of the walls, smaller doors here for the workers, and larger entryways here for Starship hardware to enter and exit the building. We can also see these raised pillars being installed to support the roofing of the next part of the building, which, at least according to SpaceX's official renders, will have a slightly higher ceiling than the rest of the factory. Over at Pad 39A, the mystery tank is starting to look pretty finished now, and the tower is looking desperate to receive its Mechazilla. The arms are pretty much done now, as seen here. They're substantially shorter than the arms we've seen at Boca Chica, and a notable thing about this photo here is that, since Greg's last flyover, these white appendages have been added to the ends of the arms. Not quite sure what these are for here, do you guys have any ideas? Also at the Roberts Road site, we can see three completed Starship launch tower segments. We're still not entirely sure where the third Starship launch and catch tower will go, but SpaceX still seem to be pressing on with its construction. We can also see this thing here. This is the cable drag chain for the chopsticks. It's used to control the motion of the cables and keep them safe from damage and metal fatigue. Reddit user Flint Smith caught the delivery of Boca Chica's cable drag train here back in October 2021. And one of my favorite things about this video is that despite this obviously being a very expensive transporter and piece of equipment, the driver is sitting on uh, a bucket. Not quite sure how this one got past safety. My only guess is that uh, it didn't. <laughs> Godspeed wherever you are these days, oh wise bucket man. <laughs> Anyway, while still kind of on the subject of aerial photography, many of you are probably familiar with RGV aerial photography of Starbase. Now, unfortunately, I don't have the permits to show their photos, but we did see some behind the scenes footage from Zach Golden of how these photos are taken. Look at that beast of a camera lens hanging out of the airplane window. That lens does need to be beefy though, as it needs to zoom a very long way down. Look how high the plane has to fly. I really hope that the following use of an RGB photography photo falls under fair use here, as I just want to showcase just how amazing that camera's zoom is. Check it out. So yeah, I thought that might be a cool little insider thing that you guys might enjoy. We saw SpaceX pull off their 31st launch into Starlink Shell 4 on Friday last week, bringing them only about four launches away from completing one of the two biggest Starlink Phase 1 shells. The launch consisted of 53 satellites, carried, as always, by a Falcon 9. This was the eighth launch for this particular booster, 1063, which had previously supported five other Starlink launches, the Sentinel-6 launch, and the NASA DART mission, which obviously completed its objectives not too long ago when it smashed into asteroid Dimorphos, altering its orbit around its parent asteroid Didymos as part of ongoing research into planetary defense in case we ever one day face a potentially world-ending asteroid impact on Earth. Anyway, uh, back to last week's Starlink mission, everything went well, as usual, and the booster completed its eighth total landing, touching down on the deck of the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You. Do you remember when SpaceX set down the lofty ambition of 60 launches in 2022? How's that going? Well, thanks to this latest graphic from Rooklan, it's all to play for. SpaceX are so far at an impressive 49 launches out of 60, or 81.7% of their goal, and we have 64 days remaining for the year, with 82.5% of the year already elapsed, so it's looking like it could go either way, but with their current pace it'll certainly be very close. Unless, of course, we count this week's Falcon Heavy launch as three separate Falcon 9 launches. <laughs> Aww. I would love to talk about this launch more, actually, but I find that whenever I talk about an upcoming major launch event on space this week, it inevitably gets delayed and I end up repeating myself for weeks on end. So make sure you hit subscribe and, of course, like the video so that you don't miss my coverage when this beast eventually takes to the skies, which, fingers crossed, should be included in my coverage in next Monday's episode of Space This Week. SpaceX have shared a photo of the rocket in the hangar at Launch Complex 39A, though. Get a look at those 27 Merlin engines all ready to put on a show. They already have, in fact, actually, to an extent. SpaceX conducted a static fire of the core and side boosters. Here's a rather cursed-looking photo from Sean Cannon, showing the headless Falcon Heavy. Spooky stuff. <laughs> Fitting that this episode is releasing on Halloween, eh? <laughs> now, we saw some spacecraft rotations on the International Space Station last week. On Sunday, the 23rd of October, saw you use Progress MS-19 autonomously undocked from the station's Poisk module before re-entering the atmosphere and being disposed of. It delivered around 2.5 metric tons of cargo, fuel, oxygen and water to the station back in February this year, and its departure was to make way for Progress MS-21, which launched aboard a Soyuz 2.1A from the Baikonur Cosmodrome on Wednesday last week, as seen here in this unedited and politically neutral footage. 
MS-21 carried a similar payload mass to MS-19, around 2.5 metric tons of cargo, fuel, oxygen and water. Now, for Americans watching and don't understand metric, this is the equivalent mass of around 0.6 2022 GMC Hummer EVs, which you can enter for your chance to win. Okay, okay, we already did the sponsor, but don't forget to click that link down below. Um, anyway, uh, segue. <laughs> I don't know what that... <laughs> the, uh, NASA's InSight lander has captured what could be the biggest ever recorded meteor impact on Mars. InSight literally felt the ground shake during an apparent impact on Mars back on Christmas Eve last year, and researchers have now identified the cause of this as one of the biggest ever recorded meteor strikes on the Red Planet. The orbiting Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter spotted a new crater on Mars's surface caused by the meteor, which is expected to have been 5 to 12 meters wide. Small enough to have burned up if it had entered Earth's atmosphere, but big enough to survive Mars's much more tenuous atmosphere, which is only about 1% the density of Earth's. Ejecta from the impact was thrown as far as 37 kilometers away. This is a really exciting moment to witness in Martian geology, and what's more, the meteoroid excavated boulder-sized chunks of ice buried closer to the Martian equator than ever found before. The impact of this meteor may be one of the last hurrahs for the InSight mission. Its solar panels have gradually become more and more occluded by dust, and as such, the spacecraft has seen its power levels drastically decline, and NASA expects it to shut down within the next six weeks, ending its scientific mission. Talk about going out with a bang, eh? <laughs> We have an amazing new photo from the James Webb Space Telescope. Last week, I talked about this amazing new photo of the Pillars of Creation captured by the Webb. This was taken by the telescope's near-infrared camera, and this week, NASA released this photo of the Pillars, taken by the telescope's mid-infrared instrument. You can see that the Pillars take on a much more ghostly appearance here. For this photo, the filtering has selected wavelengths at which the dust itself actually glows, bringing the pillars themselves into the forefront of the image, diminishing the visibility of all the stars that take up centre stage in pictures like the one taken by the near-infrared camera. In the words of co-principal investigator Professor Gillian Wright, what you can see in this new image is akin to the skin of the pillars. You can see filamentary structures which are where the stars are starting to burn through the dust, and you can see regions that are dark. They're so dense and cold that they're not even lighting up for the mid-infrared instrument. Another fantastic image here from James Webb, and I don't know, I might even prefer this one to the previous Pillars of Creation image we got. Which team are you? Team mid-infrared or team near-infrared? Go and fight it out in the comment section below. <laughs> Over to the Chinese Space Agency now, we have a couple of things to discuss. On the 29th of October, we saw the launch of a Long March 2D from the Qiquan Satellite Launch Center, which was carrying a single Cheyenne 20C satellite. The satellite was designed and is operated by the China Academy of Space Technology, and its exact purpose is classified, but it's believed to be a technology demonstration platform, serving as a pathfinder unit for future satellite technologies. In other Chinese news, a Long March 5B is ready to launch the Mentian Laboratory Module, the second extension to China's space station, which is really starting to grow in size. I often see this space station mentioned in mainstream subreddits and things, and people in the comments are often surprised that China has a space station. It's a real shame that this space station's existence isn't more common knowledge, as China are doing some great things with this thing, and the station isn't even complete. I very much look forward to watching this launch, which is currently expected to take place no sooner than, um, today. Literally like an hour after I post this video. So yeah, it might well have happened by the time you're watching this. Hopefully all went well. Make sure you've hit subscribe so you don't miss my coverage of the launch in next Monday's episode of Space This Week. Laon Aerospace had a busy week last week. That's right, after a short hiatus, we returned to flight, and on Saturday, I launched the ambitious mission of full planetary colonization in one launch. In a single flight, we deployed a Juno Relay Network, Orbital Space Station, Surface Space, Science Farm, and Crewed Rover. Check it out via the card on screen if that sounds interesting to you. And hey, if you want to see your name in lights like the good folk on the left, then consider joining my Patreon or channel membership programs to help support what I do here. Anyway, that's all from me today. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time. Should be another KSP video on Saturday, so yeah. <laughs>